right. Um, this this video is going to be in relating to the lab that we um, just recently began today, which was um, a lab relating to systems, uh, systems that are moving and specifically systems that are accelerating uh, due to a net force being applied to the system, an unbalanced amount of force being applied to the system. Um, this particular system is referred to as the Atwood machine, sometimes referred to as the modified Atwood machine because it's not a uh, purely vertical motion up or down uh, from a pulley that might be attached to a ceiling with a rope that goes around it and one mass goes up, the other mass goes down. That's the, the conventional Atwood machine. This is modified uh, in a way where one of them actually moves sideways um, and then one of them falls down. Um, your typical um, setup is like this with a pulley a car that sometimes is on wheels, um, or in this case, it's an air track, so it's moving pretty pretty smoothly without friction. This air track means uh, an air track means that there's some holes in here that are blowing air up, um, that cause us to be lifted just a little bit, so that there's not much contact between this red cart and the metal track, and so it can move almost like a air hockey puck moves more or less without friction. Um, the String, of course, is attached to um, this cart. I'm not sure why the it's not changing the position here. Maybe it's because I have to cancel this. Let's see. Hmm. Not sure why the video is not changing. Okay, uh, maybe I have to close it and restart it. So sorry. Um, hang on. It might have been necessary, but maybe it logged me out. All right, try that again. Um, all right. So this string is attached here to the cart. The string then usually runs horizontally with some tension to it uh, because the tension is created by the uh, hanging weight that usually hangs here. And it's usually attached to the string. And it might be dangling up here. And then when you set the system up and release it, the unbalanced force due to the weight of this hanging object causes motion in a downward direction. And unbalanced forces don't only call cause unbalanced forces don't only call only cause motion, but they cause accelerated motion. So as this mass starts to move in the downward direction. It'll gain speed at a certain rate. And as it moves down, since it's connected with a string to the main one, the main one will start moving to the left also with an accelerated motion. And in fact, they both end up having the same accelerated motion numerically. The magnitude of their um, accelerations are equal. So if the smaller one is gaining speed at a rate of 2 meters per second squared as it falls downward, the right one is going to be gaining speed at a rate of 2 meters per second squared as it moves leftward. Uh, because they are a system and generally, the systems that we are referencing in introductory physics all move with the same acceleration. So let's just take a closer look at the question, um, because it appears that some students may have um, struggled a little bit with identifying the two quantities that are being tested. So we're doing these labs. And um, again, we'll do many of these labs throughout the year. This is the first one for you guys from this website. You always want to start by familiarizing yourself with the tools. Um, and then, of course, after that's being done, uh, you want to really carefully read the prompt question to really, really make sure you understand what's being asked. Um, before I do that, I guess I can, even though I did show it in class, I can show again that the tools come from the top right. When you press the tool button, you can click the meter stick. That'll give you a measurement of distance. Uh, and you can move that around however you wish, put it wherever you want. And you can also have a stopwatch to carefully measure time intervals um, with a fair amount of precision to the fourth decimal here. Um, pointing out also that if you decided to you know, say that this you wanted this part here to be the beginning of your, in fact, let me just change this for a minute. Say we went to this one here. And I hit play. 
if you wanted this image, or if I want to back up a frame, notice that I'm pressing the back button to go back a frame at a time, or forward to go forward a frame at a time. If I want to back up to a certain point that I think is the first, the first, notice that, that this was connected by a string here, and he snips it with a scissor. So I might want that moment when he clicks, clips it to be the first moment. So notice that the time value actually says 0 0.016 seconds, six, seven seconds here. This is about 16 milliseconds into the experiment, and he hasn't yet clipped it. So I'd want to definitely identify that moment, boom, right there. You see that if I go back, the string is here. But one more frame, he, he cut it. So that is the first moment of the experiment. This thing is finally free to move due to the fact that there's a mass hanging right here. And that amount of mass is unbalanced. And the reason is, again, because the two forces that are battling against each other is this force that's driving the motion of the system in the downward direction. It's the weight. Notice it's not the mass. Mass is not force. The weight of this mass is force. Weight is force. And that weight is pulling downward. Let's just say the weight came out as two newtons. Then I'd wonder, how much force is resisting this? motion. Is there a physical force that's to the, to the right over here by the scissors, a vector that would be pointing rightward? If there were friction there, then yeah, that would be a resistive force. And if there was two newtons of downward force here and one newton of frictional force to the right, then the net force or unbalanced force would be the extra amount of force in a certain direction. That's what net force is. Two minus one is one. That means there's an extra one newton of force pulling down compared to the resistive force. Again, that assumes in my scenario that I just created, just to explain that, assumes there was two newtons of force being pulled down due to its weight, and one newton of frictional force to the right, back here. Friction between this track and this red cart. Then the net force would be, again, two minus one, which is one newton. That would be the net force. But in this case, they've, they've gone to great length to try to create a zero friction system. Can't be exactly zero friction, but it's probably pretty close. Again, this is an air track designed so that this thing can move almost without touching the metal because there's air blowing out of this upwards to lift it just a little bit. So it moves like an air hockey puck does on a table, an air hockey table. Um, so we know that friction is pretty much negligible in this case, in which case the net force, there would be no, there would be no frictional force back here. The net force would just be this amount of weight, whatever this amount of weight is. All right, so the idea, um, again, is to, in this particular experiment, to investigate how the amount of weight or force, gravitational force from the Earth, which is known as weight, how this amount of weight affects the actual acceleration of the system, which is another way of saying that how rapidly this car speeds up which is also equivalent to saying how rapidly this thing falls down, depends on how much weight you're hanging here, right? If you're hanging a lot of force, a lot of weight here rather, that might be a lot of force. You might expect this thing to zip to the left very rapidly and have a very high acceleration rate. On the other hand, if it's something very light, not a lot of force, downward force, not a lot of weight, you might not expect the acceleration rate to be that impressive. Maybe just a small acceleration rate. It still would move, but at a gain speed at a slow rate. The purpose of the experiment, again, at least for part one, is to investigate what the correlation is between the two quantities. What are the two quantities? How the acceleration of the system is affected by the net force acting on the system. Uh, again, you have, you have your, your meter stick to measure distances. You have your stopwatch here. And since that would have been the first moment where this thing can finally start to move, I'd want to reset this clock. Because again, remember, if I back up one, the string is there. I go one more forward, fo one more frame forward, it's gone. So I'd reset it. This is now the beginning of my experiment. It's free to move at this point. Now I can certainly go, you know, in forward in time, and each time I click a frame on this down here, you'll notice that the timer increases by about four milliseconds each time I click next. It's advancing by about four milliseconds, which is one divided by 240, because that's the amount of frames per second. 100, 200, one out of, sorry, there's 240 frames images being shown over a one second video clip. And so each frame represents one out of 240 seconds, one divided by 240, which comes out as 0 0.004, four milliseconds. So each time I click next, you'll see that this keeps track of that, this timer, right? 
So I, again, I, I need to come back to really the, the part of which is the reading part, which is here, which again, it, I don't particularly love the uh, way they've ordered this, but I did address that at the start of class. Um, this part actually just says to become familiar with the tools, which I showed you, the meter stick and the stopwatch. Down here, it shows you, hey, here's a graph and you know, data table and graph that you'll be using to collect your data. And then here, here's the prompt question. Let's read it and let's read it carefully because I noticed that this was a struggle and that's okay. I'm not trying to say anything mean. I'm just saying I'm, I'm as a teacher pointing out something that was difficult for the class, which was to identify the two quantities that were actually going to be measured. So we want to be very careful in our reading uh, because they've guided us very specifically into um, which direction this lab needs to go in, in terms of what the two quantities are. Let's read it. Design an experiment to determine the relationship between acceleration of the system and the accelerating force, the force that causes that acceleration, the force applied, the net force, the amount of net force acting on the system. Because this is a Newton's second law, this is a Newton's second law lab, right? This is an investigating how does acceleration, which, by the way, you know, if I type in Newton's second law and hit images, you're going to see, you know, Newton's second law, I would assume, somewhere in here. Um, there it is. The net force equals m times a. I figured I'd see it a little larger than that somewhere in here, but I don't. Oh, there's our problem. There it is. That's the one with friction, though. Um, I don't see it. Surprised at that. But uh, acceleration, the acceleration of a system is equal to the net force divided by the mass of the system, right? This is just F net equals M times A. It's Newton's second law. And how rapidly it accelerates the system, which is A, is equal to the net force divided by the mass, right? So this lab is having you investigate those, those ideas. The first part is, Let's see how the acceleration is affected by the net force. That's part one. That's the part I had just read. Let's see how the acceleration is affected by the force, the net force, it should say. And then in part two, which we get to at some other time, let's separately investigate how the acceleration of the system is affected by the overall mass of the system. Because Newton's second law says the acceleration depends on two things. Depends on how much unbalanced force there is on the system, as well as the overall mass of the system, how much inertia it has, how much resistance to motion. Right? So it's a two-part lab. So in this case, I see the, again, if asked, what are the two quantities under investigation? It's acceleration and net force. Now you'd have to decide, where will you put these? Do you put acceleration here, or do you put acceleration here? Do you put net force here, or do you put net force here? Well, you have to think about, which one is the cause and which one is the effect? When they talk about independent variables and dependent variables, the independent variable is the thing that you can freely choose to change. And in this particular lab, the freedom of your choice is in the mass of this hanging object right here. You can see that you can click change and you can change that to any one of the values that you wish. If you want this to be at 800 grams, I can click here and then hit load. Now it brings up the experiment with this being 800 grams. Or if I wanted to do a, you know, a, a 600 gram one or a 500 gram one, I can click load and it will re repeat the experiment with only 500 grams here. So this is my independent choice. This is the control. This is the control on this experiment. This is what you have control of. This is independent. I mean, hey, isn't it an independent choice? Can I independently choose this right now? I can and therefore it's the independent variable. The independent variable is usually the thing that you consider the cause in the cause and effect scenario. Once I've made a choice here, once I've independently made a choice, though it usually makes sense to step through the lab in these partic this particular sequence, once I've made my choice, what will that affect? Well, let's first say, what is this changing? Yeah, it's changing the mass, true, but mass is not a force. Right? Mass is not a force. I've got 700 grams here now hanging. What force does that create? The force of weight. 
the gravitational force, which is the Earth's gravity, pulling down on this object. It creates a force. And if I was drawing a force vector, I would draw a little vector there pointing down. In fact, um, let me see if I can pull something up here. So this is a downward force, the force of gravity, right? Known as the object's weight. Is that the force they were referring to? Well, I don't know. Is it the unbalanced force? Well, remember, this one has two forces. In fact, I have to shorten that. Sorry. Um, shoot. This object that's hanging has two forces acting on it. Technically, it has three because air resistance is still a force that it feels while it moves through the air in the downward direction, but we're ignoring that force. This force has the wire pulling upward on it, which is the tension force. And it has its own weight down, Fg. Equals the weight. It doesn't equal the mass, right? This equals the weight. Oop, I'm not sure why that just happened. Weight and mass are not the same. Weight is m times g. Right? m times g. How do we turn a mass into a force? Calculate its weight. Depends on the planet that it's on. It depends on how much gravity there is on that planet. And we would multiply those together to get the weight. Right? How about over here? Remember that the rope has the same tension everywhere throughout it. If I feel this with my fingers, I'd feel a certain amount of tightness there, the same tightness here. Anywhere I felt the tightness, how taut that rope is, I, or, or put a, an actual sensor in there that would sense that tension, it would tell me that the tension is the same where all along this. And even here, the amount would be the same as it is in here. Because this is very, very light string. So when the string is pretty much very small amount of mass, the amount of hanging mass from this string here wouldn't put a, that much extra tension at this bottom. But if this was a chain, by the way, if this was a heavy-duty chain or a heavy-duty rope, like a construction site rope, you would have the same tension along the whole rope here, but then you'd get more tension in this area. Because this area doesn't only have, like the bottom here, it doesn't only have the tension that's in here, in this area, at this point of the rope, but it has some extra tension because the rope in this section right here has some weight to it. And this area of the rope has to support that weight, right? So you'd end up having a little more, um, actually saying it, saying it backwards, sorry. The point would, of the rope that would be right here, right here, would be end up being more tension in the, in the rope here than along here. Because this part of the rope right here has the area underneath it of this rope, which if this had some significant mass or weight to it, this part of the rope right where my dot is would, would feel that. It would feel that extra weight hanging here. And so it would not only have the tension that's along this part of the rope, it would have some extra, extra bit due to the, this weight that's beneath it. But when, again, we have um, strings that have almost no mass and no weight, we could pretty much say that the tension everywhere is the same along this string. So for that reason, if I was drawing the tension vector pulling on this object over here, this red thing, these tensions are the same. If this is 20 newtons of tension, this is 20 newtons of tension, right? And those cancel. Those are two thing, two forces in the opposite direction, right? This one points essentially, they're essentially pointing towards each other, just that this got turned because of the pulley. If this got straightened out so the whole thing was flat, this vector would be pointing to the right, and this vector would be pointing to the left. And I'd say, what do those add up to? Well, they're opposite in direction. They have the same value. They cancel. They don't provide any unbalanced force. Internal, it's an internal force. And internal forces don't provide for enough, you know, they don't provide force that causes motion for the system as a whole. You need forces that are external to the system to cause motion. And the only thing that's external to this system, and the system is defined as the red thing and this thing here, technically including the rope and the pulley, the external thing that's causing the motion is the earth underneath it. The Earth is not considered part of our system. 
And that earth is pulling down on this object over here. And it's, that earth is external to the system and external forces are of interest because they can cause the system to accelerate. You might argue, but doesn't this force cause this guy to move to the left? I'd say, yeah, that's true. But it's just communicating essentially however much force is being um, you know, happening on this side to this, this guy here, communicating that force over to him. Um, because remember, like I had said in class, if this was a gravity-free environment where we were in the space station and you set this all up and released it, it wouldn't move, right? It would just hover. Everything would just hover there. This would have no tension to it. It would go completely slack. The only reason there is tension is because this has weight in, gra in a gravity field like Earth's gravity. Pulling down causes the tension along here. So in the space station, if you set this up, this tension would be completely slack, uh, and you definitely would not get any motion. And you'd say, okay, okay, I guess that's true. So the, the tension in the rope is not really important. I'd say, yeah, not to mention it's actually zero tension. The only thing that drives this system's motion is the weight of the hanging guy over here. What about the normal force from the track pushing up? You can certainly put it in there. We've done this before. We've talked about this stuff, Fn. He also has some weight. Earth is also pulling down on him. But those are in balance. Those are balanced, right? Because he's not going to move up or down. He's just going to move left due to this unbalanced leftward force on him. But the vertical forces are balanced, so they're not of interest, right? So this cancels. This cancels. This tension force cancels with this tension force. What is the net force on the system? This is the net force on the system. This is the amount of unbalanced force there is on the system. So in this experiment, when they said, let's investigate how the accelerating force, which is mg, affects the acceleration of the system, how rapidly this thing speeds up. All right, so let's do that. How would we actually do that? So let's just step through a couple parts to that. So calculating the weight is as simple as doing m times g. If I come over here and say, all right, I'm going to start with my first data point, um, which I'd like to choose, but it didn't seem to let me pick it. There we go. My first data point looks like um, the system mass, remember, is the total mass of the system, this plus this, which it says is 400 grams, while the hanging mass if I choose this one, is only 0.1 grams. Let's click it. It shows that the amount of mass hanging from here is such a small amount that there's no weight, effectively no weight over here. It's the same idea as being in outer space. The string goes slack. So how much weight is here on this side? Well, the mass is so tiny that the weight is effectively zero, but not quite. We're assuming it's essentially zero weight how much acceleration do we get? Let's see. Zero. We get zero, zero acceleration. So our first data point really should be zero, zero, right? We have to come in here and now put zero and zero. But we still have to decide which one goes on which side, right? The first column is what you want on the x-axis. The second column is what you want on your y-axis. It's always true. The control, the thing that you get to freely change throughout the experiment goes on the left side. The thing that's affected by that decision goes on the right side, which means the independent variable, which is the thing that you get to freely choose independently, goes on the left side. The dependent variable goes on the right side. What's the thing that we get to freely choose over here? Not mass, even though that's true. We're investigating how the accelerating force, which was the weight of the hanging object, affects the acceleration. Yeah. My apologies, I didn't realize that I can put the units underneath. I'll put them here. Meters per second. Here, I can put newton newtons. Weight is a force. Mass is not a force. Weight is the force that Earth's gravity applies to a certain object that has mass. And that's not this again, that's not the same. If you, they're not the same thing. If you went into outer space, there's no gravity out there, there's no weight, there's no downward pull. You just float. The variable here would be A, 
And the variable here would be usually FG is what we would write for force of gravity, or you could put W, but I encourage you to stay away from W because later we're going to be talking about work and energy and work has the same symbol W, to cap, both capital W. Avoid any confusion. Just get used to putting FG. When there was zero weight, there was zero acceleration, right? All right. How do we get some actual data points though? All right, let's talk about that. Let's do one. Coming back, oops, coming back here, come back to this here. Let me select um, a hanging mass of let's say 20 grams with a total system mass of 400 grams. That means if the hanging mass was 20 grams, this guy was gonna be 380. So that 380 plus 20 gives us the total system mass of 400. Let's load it. Okay. So now I have to think, I can certainly calculate the weight of this thing, right? Let's, well, let's do that. One little chip there. M times G. That's the amount of force, right, that we're talking about. That's what they called the accelerating force. Well, how much mass does he have? Notice he has 20 grams. But we can't use grams, we have to use kilograms, right? So you have to think, well, there's a thousand grams in one kilogram, right? One kilo is 1,000 grams. So that means I'd have to move my decibel point over one, two, three times, right? Moving it over two would be 0.2, moving it over three would be 0.02. So I know that this thing's mass is 0 0.02 kilograms. And I have to then multiply that times G, which is 9.8, to determine this thing's weight, which means we're trying to calculate how much physical force Earth is pulling down on it with. Let's do it on a calculator. I'm doing it now, 0 0.02 times 9.8, enter. I get 0.196. Newtons. Okay, so that's how I would calculate that particular amount of accelerating force. Okay, let's go put it into our data table. 0.196. Why can I not? Oh, I'm still not. Okay, try again. There we go. Over to, where am I? Oh, sorry, that's right. I'm not going to another data table. It's right here. Um, 0 0.196, 0 0.196. All right, so that's the weight, right? Now, this becomes the big question mark, right? Acceleration. Some students might be inclined to say, oh, it's 9.8. Right? Acceleration, anytime you see acceleration, put 9.8. Don't fall into that trap. The acceleration of an object is only 9.8 meters per second squared on Earth when the only force it feels is its own weight and it's falling due to that force. Right? If I had used this idea that the net force is equal to m times a, and I imagine that the object was falling with the only force being downward, its own weight, no upward force, our object that's on the left side of our screen that was hanging wouldn't meet that criteria because it feels an upward tension force while it moves downward because the downward weight is more than the tension force. It's unbalanced in the down direction, so it'll still accelerate, but it won't accelerate at 9.8. That's only true, again, when the net force, the only force, is equal to the weight. There's no upward forces, there's just a downward force, and the net force is equal to the weight. When that's true, the object will accelerate at a rate of g. Only when the only force is pulling it downward is its weight and it's in so-called free fall. Because free fall is described as that scenario where it's falling and it feels no other forces other than the force of gravity, its own weight due to Earth's pull. It feels no air resistance force or any other forces from ropes. And only in that scenario, it will accelerate at a rate of G. If there's a rope pulling up on it or there's an air resistance force that it feels in the upwards direction while it falls, all of those scenarios are not called free fall, and all of those scenarios will create accelerations that are less than G. Because an upward force, while falling down, is gonna reduce that acceleration rate. 
don't fall into that trap where you think acceleration is always 9.8. Definitely not. We have to calculate the acceleration. How will we do that? Well, usually, as I said, you have to use kinematic equations, and then you have to make some measurements. And I had to advise students at the start of class to consider that, what kinematic equations you would need to use, what measurements you would need to make. As we go back to the screen, had I looked at our three kinematic equations, I could write them here and think, would this be a useful formula or a useful tool to use at this time because we know we need to calculate the acceleration, and there it is, so maybe this is a good choice. We can measure time because we have a stopwatch. How do we know what the velocity is, though? Right? Technically, you could, but it wouldn't be very accurate because if you decided to pick this as point one and this as point two, and time, how long it takes to go from here to here, stick that in, well, I should say, if you decided to say you were going to just use x equals v times t, where this would be the average velocity, and this would really be delta x, where delta x now goes between these two points, and you could certainly measure that distance, and that's true, because you're thinking, I'm going to use this formula. I really like it. A is there. I can time it. Good. I'm just going to, I'm going to calculate the final velocity after some amount of time. Again, if you picked those two positions, and forwarded the video to start here and end here, and measured this distance, which you could do, and timed the amount, figured out the amount of time that it took to go from here to here, which you could do, the velocity you calculate is actually the average velocity between here and here, just like on the runner for the exam that you just took. Sending somebody to the end of the race to time how long, or to, to time him from start of the race to the end of the race, in a goal to determine his acceleration would not be the correct choice because the amount of time that you've timed is the whole entire race. That would be useful if the race length is 100 meters and this was the time, total time to get through the race. Yeah, you can calculate the average velocity, but that's not the velocity he had when he stopped accelerating. Right? I mean, you would know. You'd have to, you'd have to think about that carefully. You could say, all right, well, can I shrink this down to become more accurate? What if I could do like this point and this point? Now I can repeat the same idea here, but the average velocity is now the velocity average of the velocities between this point and this point. And since they're so close in time, this value will be very close to the true velocity it has right, right here in this area. And say, yeah, that's actually a far better estimate. And you could technically have done that. You could have said v initial at zero, cross this out. You could have made these so close together in time. And on a, with a video like this, you could technically pull that off, measuring the small distance and the small time value, sticking that time interval here, crossing this out, solve for v final. I'm sorry, I didn't say that. Uh, put the time value in here, measure the small distance, put it in here, solve for the average velocity between those two points. You could technically have stuck that here. Um, in fact, you wouldn't be able to cross out the initial. Now I think about that. The initial <laughs> poses another problem. Would have been the initial velocity that it has when it reaches this first point. And there's a conundrum, I guess. I didn't think about it. Actually, no, this is not the way to do it. Right? You can't say V initial is zero. That's all the way back in the beginning. But if you've chosen these two points, this V initial is the speed that it has when it enters this dot right here, which you still wouldn't know. So you have an unknown and an unknown, two unknowns, round and round it goes down the rabbit hole. It's not going to work. This is not the formula you'd want to use. Which one do we want to use? I mean, this could have been the other one, but that would give us the same issue, right? It would have been this one. Same issue, right? Yeah, at least there's a distance in there, which is good, because we can measure distances in this lab, delta x. Acceleration is there. That's good. But there's a velocity issue again. Yeah. What about the third one? And this, again, is the hardest part for all students. Taking something that's a formula and seeing, you know, getting over the abstractions of a formula and trying to figure out how do you apply it in the real world. Which other one do we have? Delta x equals 1 half at squared. 
how would we use this? Well, let's pick two points in the video. I'll do that in a minute. I'll measure the distance delta x, which is the displacement between those two points. I'll figure out the time that elapsed between those two points, carefully using my stopwatch and resetting it at the first frame that I choose. Plugging in here for t, plugging in here for delta x, and solving for the acceleration. Let's try it. I'm going to go forward, 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 hopefully until I see that string. I'm watching this string over here very carefully. Let's see if it snips. Here, here it's starting to move. Boop, up, up, right about there, I'd say. I'll call that the first. I'll call that the first one, although maybe it really should be back a couple. Technically, it's free to move. Right about there. That's the first moment of this experiment where this thing is free to move. Previously, the tension in this string, by the way, that he just cut, you can think to yourself, how much tension would have been in this before he cut it? It's an AP level question. How much tension is in this string over here before he cuts it? Well, if it's in balance, if this system is not moving, which is called static equilibrium, not, not moving, everything's static. Equilibrium means all the forces are balanced. There me must be something canceling out this other one over here that we know becomes unbalanced soon as this snips. Well, that means before he snips it, there must be a force to the right, right here, which is a tension force. How much must that be equal to if before he snips it? Must be equal to mg. Must be equal to 0 0.196 newtons. If you put a tension gauge in there, it would say 0 0.196 newtons. So that that amount of force in that direction, which is about 0 0.2 newtons, and a force that's in the other direction, this is away from the direction of motion. This is in the direction of motion. They're in opposite directions. They have the equal amounts of force. It should cancel. But the moment he snips that, that force that's balancing it right now goes away. But as soon as he snips it, it's unbalanced. And Isaac Newton said, well, the moment it becomes unbalanced, the object or system will either speed up or slow down, not remain at a constant speed. That would be balanced. He says it will have to accelerate, speed up or slow down at a rate that depends on how much force there is that's unbalanced and what the overall mass of the system is. That's what he meant by A equals F net divided by M. Okay, So let's pick our two points. I already selected this because the string just snapped. And I'm therefore going to reset my clock to zero seconds. And now I'm going to pick another point. I'm going to actually make my mark. I'll use my, my, my red dot here if I could to maybe make a mark. And this is another part you have to decide. Like, how are you going to measure distances? I think I can measure from the front of the car. I'll make a little dot there. And then I'm going to move my ruler so that that's layered over at the zero centimeter mark, <clears throat> right? I'm going to leave that. I don't want to move that. That would screw up my experiment, right? It has to stay in the same spot. Now I'm going to pick a certain time a little bit in the future. I could go one frame at a time, but that would take a long time. I'd like to go a little further in the future, so I'll just use my uh, ability to click down here in the video bar down here and just go forward a little bit. Back up a little bit. All right, that's sufficient for me. It's about almost half the distance of this whole thing. I'm going to make a little mark. Make another one here. And now I have to measure that distance. Let's get rid of that formula that definitely is not going to help us. All right, so now I just have to recognize that this is the displacement that we've just observed, delta x. It has occurred in a certain amount of time. Looks like 1.24 seconds. And I can now use that data once I've measured this distance, which I haven't yet, but once I do, to plug in here and solve for A. Let's just solve for A algebraically. Technically, I'd have to multiply both sides by 2 because I want to get rid of my 1 half times 2 is 1. This goes away, and this goes away. 
So now I have 2 times delta x equals at squared. I would then have to divide both sides by a. Cancel. Cancel. I now have t squared equals 2 delta x over a. My final move is to square root. Oh, my apology. I'm, not sol I'm used to solving for time. Let me back up. Not solving for time. In this case, we're solving for acceleration. Not dividing by that. Let me erase this. We're solving for the acceleration, right? We're solving. For, this is our unknown that we're solving for. So I'm dividing both sides by t squared. T squared cancels here. And now we've got ourselves a, reading it backwards, a equals 2 delta x over t squared. All right. So now we can plug in some numbers. I have to measure this distance. What is it? It looks like it went from 0 to, I'm going to say 38 centimeters. So I know that this distance is 38 centimeters, which would be 0 0.38. Be careful there. Easy spot to make, a, make that mistake. It has to be in meters. Divided by, how long did it take to go from the original spot to the final spot? Well, Move it a little bit so we can see it. 1.24 seconds. I don't need the other decimals. It's fine. So 1.24 squared. Don't forget about the square. All right. So I'm going to do a computation. I'm going to do the 1.24 squared first, just so I to make sure I don't make a mistake. Students do make mistakes on calculators, even though they've written it down correctly. I would recommend doing it in pieces. Start with the denominator first. 1.24 squared, enter. All right, you can write that down or you can store it as X. If you're using a graphing calculator, you'd press the STO button on the bottom left above the on button, and then you'd press the X button, which is uh, under mode, and hit enter, and it will store that value as X. That's what I'm going to do, store as X, enter. Now work out the numerator, 2 times 0.38, enter. I get 0.76 divide by x. You just press divide and hit the x button. Or divide by the number that you just wrote down. Hit enter. All right. I get 0 0.49 rounded to two decimals. So I'm getting my first data point of 0 0.49 meters per second squared. That's just for my first data point, right? So now I would come over here and go to here. This is where it helps to, um, let me see a second. Uh, I keep forgetting. So I'd come down here and type that in, 0 0.49, my first data point. I'm not going to do the whole lab for you, but I've just described how you do one complete data point. You'd now have to repeat the process by changing the independent variable, change the control. The thing that you control is the weight, right? So you'd come back to the lab. And I'm going to actually erase all of this. It's on the screen. You can always rewind the video if you wanted to see it later. Um, so I would then come back here, and I would now move on to the next trial. The thing I can change, the independent variable, the thing that goes on the left side of the two columns is the mass. But really, again, I'm changing the weight because as soon as I select more mass, Earth will pull, pull harder down on that mass with more force, more gravity force, more weight. But you have to be careful with the system mass. Again, I've decided to just keep this one here the same. Um, in fact, let me think about that. Um, a little confusing to me. If I were to move on to um, this one, uh, 
Oh, that makes sense. I'm just trying to think about something. Sorry about that. So move. You would want to. I would su su highly suggest that you leave this system mass one alone. You don't want to touch that. Just leave it alone. Because what we're doing is we have to keep something constant. And I'm just thinking that through now. You want the system's mass to remain constant. You don't want there to be a different amount of acceleration because the overall mass of the s system has changed. And that would be easy to do. In the real world, if you left this guy with the same chips that are on him right now as the same mass, and then add a little bit of mass over here as you move on to your second trial, the total system's mass will actually increase. The downward weight force will increase, but so will the total system's mass. That will throw off your data. You don't want to change two things in an experiment. You want to change only one thing and keep everything else the same. So for that reason, they've so carefully and cleverly thought of that through and said, well, if you decide to add 20 grams to the hanging mass and going from 20 grams to 40 grams, we're going to remove one of those 20 gram chips from this. You can see the chips up here so that the total mass still stays the same and it doesn't throw off your experiment. That's all coming together for me now as I you know, think, think that through. And that's great. So leave this as, as it is, or wherever you were, just leave it on that. The one thing you're changing is the hanging mass. Remember, that's our control. So you move on to the next data, next amount of weight, next amount of mass, hit load. Rinse and repeat. You notice there's two chips now. Before there was one chip. Now there's two chips. I'm going to guess that each chip is, 40, is 20 grams. You'd have to determine the new amount of force here, which is the weight, force of gravity, by doing this new mass value times g. And you'd have to do a, the same exact process for determining the acceleration using the same formula. You don't have to rederive it. Once you've derived it once, that's the beauty of deriving it like I had in the, in the beginning. Right? Once you've derived that formula algebraically, you just rinse and repeat. You use the same formula. You just plug in your distance, and you plug in your time and you determine the acceleration. Once you have that second data point, of course, you would come down here and add your second data point, right? So this is the general process. And you're eventually going to get some graph. Why are we trying to get the graph? Because we're trying to determine the mathematical relationship between weight, the weight of the hanging mass, because that's why they decided to call it the accelerating force. Because you could technically claim that, well, doesn't the car that's on top have some weight too? Yeah, but does that cause it to accelerate? No. The weight that's on, on the car is balanced with the normal force that goes up. It's not, it's not an unbalanced weight. It's just an extra load. It's, it's, it's an extra amount of dead weight that the system has to pull, right? So we were interested in, in the, that's why they use the word accelerating force, the one that's actually causing the acceleration, the hanging weight. Maybe it's even worth, worth putting it in here, ha hanging weight, just so you're clear. It's the hanging weight here, changing. So you would recalculate the new weight, recalculate the acceleration, and you would continue doing that. Again, to determine what is this mathematical relationship. Remember that if we have two variables, and I'm going to post this online after I'm done with this video, which is very soon. If you have you know, y, y is proportional to x, two variables are directly proportional to each other, then you know there's going to be some linear relationship. If the real formula has a coefficient, which it would, like a times x, like y equals 2x, then the slope is a. Right? The slope would be 2. The slope would be whatever this coefficient is. Right? Like y equals mx, it's like m. right? On the other hand, if you have y is proportional to x squared, what kind of graph? If one of the variables, you've been, again, y and x are just dummy variables. They're just generic letters to represent whatever variable you might have been investigating. If one of them happened, y ended up being proportional to the square of the other, what evidence would you have for that on your graph? You'd have this. If you wanted to linearize this data, what would you have to do? Again, assuming that this formula this has some sort of coefficient to it, some sort of number in front of the x squared, or some number here, to linearize the data, 
And I'm doing this only because my smart board is broken, by the way. My pen is not working. Fortunate. Wish I had it, but I have to do this with my mouse. To linearize the data, since y is proportional to x squared if your graph came out this way, you get rid of the constants, the things that are not just not like a number. These are the variables, y and x squared, and you would graph those. So you would graph y versus x squared. In fact, um, am I saying that backwards? My apologies. I didn't mean I didn't do that backwards. Entered it in backwards. you would want to put your y variable here, and now you're going to be putting your, you would put x squared here, here. What does this mean? It just means that if this was your x, this was your x variable, right? This is like x, and this was y, and this was the, the shape you said saw, and it said to linearize it, you would have to take all these x values here and square them, and create a new column of this number squared. Well, zero squared is zero. 0 0.196 squared. And you'd have to get a new number. Whatever that new number is, that's the new number that's here. You have to do that for all your data points. Then you would graph the x squared versus the y value, which doesn't change at all. That just stays the same. Once you've done that, you'd end up with linear data. You would have linearized it. What would the slope of this be? This would end up being the slope, this coefficient again. As soon as you've linearized something that's in this format of y equals ax squared, and you've forced this into to being x, and you've forced this into being y, and the y-intercept is 0, which is the plus b, right? You see that the y-intercept will be 0. And this is the slope. Right, so the slope of this graph is whatever whatever the coefficient to this is. If this was a distance equals one half at squared graph, for example, and the t squared was matching here, then a this coefficient is everything in front of the t squared. This would be a. I've taught you about that before couple, you know, way back when, but we went over this, so this maybe reminding you. We've, we've reviewed this, or we've, we've covered this. Now you're seeing it again. I'm not saying that you're graphing this formula, because you're not. You just use this formula to calculate the acceleration, but this is the idea. What are some other possibilities that you might see in this graph? I'm, I'm sorry. Some other possibilities that you might see in this lab. You might end up graphing it and seeing something that looks like this. What is, this, what is this suggesting? It's suggesting that as one variable increases, the other decreases. As this one goes from 2 to 4 to 6 to 8, becomes a larger value, the y value at 2 is here. The y value at 4 is less. The y value at 6 is even less. It's a tiny value. As 1 increases, the x increases, the y decreases. This is an inverse relationship, right? So this would be indicating to you that y is inversely proportional to x. And if there was truly some number up here in the real formula, like a over x, this is just a constant number, like the number 5, then you'd have to think, how could I get that number from linearizing? Well, if you've just determined that this is the proportion, because this is what an inverse graph looks like, and you can just graph, you know, you can just Google inverse inverse graph, right? inverse graph, at images, right? This is, I should say, inverse, sorry, inversely proportional, inversely proportional graph. There it is, right there. As soon as you see that shape, you know it's an inverse relationship. You know that more of one thing is creating less of something else. 
So if we were, we were now trying to linearize this and we recognize this shape and recognize, oh, that's an inverse relationship. Well, when we're linearizing it, you would want to graph one over X in one column and y in the other column. What does that mean? It means that if you had the number over here like 0.196 and you were doing this, one over x, you'd end up having to do one divided by 0.196 and getting a new number and that number stays in this box. And then whatever number is over here, you'd have to do one divided by that number and that would be the number that stays in this box. The y value would stay the same. And then you'd graph it. And if you did graph it, you would put y here and 1 over x, right? 1 over x is, becomes the x column. So the first column becomes 1 over x. And this column is, becomes, is the y. So that means when you're labeling your graphs, 1 over x is actually being plotted here. This number, whatever number was here, 1 divided by 0 0.196, whatever the number is, that's what's on this graph over here. If you've linearized it properly, a graph that originally looked like this, will look like this. It won't have a curve to it, it'll be linear. What will the slope be equal to? Well, if we pulled this apart, this piece right here, A over X, it's technically one over X. It's technically A times one over X, right? A times 1 over X is A over X, right? So if this has been forced onto your X axis, the Y intercept is zero, which is here. Well, this would be the B. Oh, I am like, uh, no, I'm saying that backwards, sorry. B is the one that I put down here. This is plus zero because it's coming out of the origin. The y-intercept is zero. I'm forcing this into a linear format. Then the slope is, yet again, whatever was up here. Whatever A is, that's the slope. It's the slope of this graph is A. Now let me remind you that this lab was a Newton's second law lab. It was a lab that is investigating whether Newton's second law is correct or not which is A equals F net over M. And there's two proportions embedded in his theory. His first proportion is that the acceleration is directly proportional to the net force. Right? If that's a true statement, you should be able to do a lab that investigates how the net force affects the acceleration. And you did, that's part one. And if it ends up being a correct statement that in fact they are directly proportional to each other, when you graph them, they should be linear, right? And if they are linear, what does the slope of that become? Slope is one over M, right? This again would be on your Y axis. This is being put onto your X axis. When you graph it, it will come right out of the origin, right over here. So the slope in that first part is equal to one over the total mass of the system. This is the total mass. The to one over the total mass. Sorry, that's messy, but it's a mouse that I'm trying to write with. So if you graph it and it comes out linear, it's, it's proof that yes, he was correct because his formula states that the acceleration should be directly proportional to the net force. And if slow, you've got evidence because it's directly proportional through the linear data that you've just graphed, and the slope would be the one over M. That's what's hiding over here, one over M. One over the total mass of the system. That's what the slope would be. What's the other part to Newton's second law? Because again, there's two parts to it. That's the first part, which is why the, in this experiment they called it part one. So 
I were to Google Newton's second law, yeah, Newton's second law. Again, the acceleration of an object is of an object as produced by a net force is directly proportional to the net force. It's a little wordy, but it's saying that the acceleration is directly proportional to the net force. And the formula here, the acceleration is directly proportional to the net force. Yep, that's part one of the experiment. What's part two? Oop. Part two says the acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass of the object that's actually accelerating due to that force. Meaning more mass, as long as the force that's moving it stays the same, a heavier, more massive object will accelerate less. Acceleration is inversely proportional, right? And so my point, my last point, is that when you're looking at his formula, the second part, first part is saying, stating that the acceleration is directly proportional to the net force. The second part is stating that the acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass because they're on opposite sides of the formula. One's in the numerator, one's in the denominator, and that's how you identify inverse proportions. If it's a true statement, what should the graph look like? look like that. If you linearize it, what will it look like? It will look like that, doing this process that's shown here. What will the slope of this graph represent when you do this, the second part? Which you haven't even started yet, it's part two. I'll let you think about that. You'd always have to come back to the formula that models the experiment. This is the formula that models the experiment. Newton's second law models this experiment, and we're trying to essentially prove by providing evidence that it's a correct statement, it's a correct formula. It's not only a correct statement, just generally that more of this makes more of that, or more of this makes less of that, or vice versa, but numerically, it's actually correct that doubling the net force does in fact double the acceleration. That's what his statement says, that they're directly proportional or doubling the mass, as long as the force that's moving it stays the same, doubling the mass reduces the acceleration by a factor of two, meaning you get half of the acceleration if the mass is twice as much, as long as the force in those two scenarios is the same. And you're proving that not only, again, is it qualitatively correct, but numerically, quantitatively, it's correct as well. Because if it was not quantitatively correct, these shapes wouldn't come out of these graphs from this experiment. All right, I've done what I said I would do. I hope that you find that helpful. Um, and this is a good opportunity for you to continue practicing your experimental um, thinking and your experimental processes uh, to help you better understand kind of how these, um, these experiments play out. It takes practice though. This is, you know, this is advanced stuff for a lot of students, even AP students, absolutely. And a lot of AP students, even in high level math classes, have quite honestly just haven't done a lot of stuff like this because it's never been taught to you. So that's partially the one of the hats that I play or that I wear is, is partially a math teacher and partially a physics teacher, although primarily a physics teacher, but partially math too. Um, so don't worry if you find it hard. Everybody finds it hard. I found it hard. I had to work my butt off to try to understand all of this and it takes time. But if it's something you continue to struggle with and it's something that you continually think, I'm still not getting this after two or three or four times, don't feel bad, just act accordingly. Come and ask for help. I offer help to students on Fridays from 12.30 to 1.45, which is a virtual help session. Just schedule in advance via email. Or I had even recently rec uh, offered to students that I could make myself available on Monday through Thursday after school if you'd like, since I always stay until 2.30. From 1.45 to 2.30, I'm always here, usually grading papers. But if a student said, I'd like some extra help. This is hard for me. Could you help me? Which I'd recommend you doing if you find that that describes you at some point, then I can make myself available on those days. You just have to email and let me know that you want to help. But again, being that AP student, which a lot of AP students are, I'm not saying any one of you, you in particular are, but being that AP student that plays five different sports and does, you know, does this, this, this committee and this, you know, has this role here and does, and you know what I'm referring to. Uh, and in addition to four different AP classes, and when I say, but to some people, if that conversation comes up, like, are those students coming for extra help? And I have to say, no, they're not. And we have to ask, of course, why not? And we get the response, 
well, you know, they do this sport and they have their job and they have they have three different other AP classes. Well, that's that's what that was a decision the student has made. And I'm not saying that that's bad. You want to become involved. You want to be active in all of those things. But if you overload yourself too much, if you have too much weight on your back, eventually you'll collapse. And life is much about the optimization of the expectations that some of you have for yourselves, or it could be for the, what your parents have for you, or both. And it's trying to balance those expectations with reality, with the fact that people can't get spread too thin, right? They have to carefully think about how much they're willing to take on, because if they take on too much, nothing ends up getting done well. Either all of it gets done in a subpar way, meaning not, not really great in any of those things, or in some cases, some of them get done partially and some of them just are dropped completely. And so you really want to start thinking about that, I, I'd suggest to you all. Um, may apply to some more than others. What's on your plate? Uh, if something's hard for you, are you coming for the extra help? Uh, I am available here uh, to support those students of mine whenever they need it, so you just have to let me know that that's something that might interest you. That concludes for today. I hope that you found uh, this, meet, this uh, Google Meet video useful. See you next time.